थैंक यू एस फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी सो यूनिक प्लेटफॉर्म ऑफ हैविंग स्पीकर्स फ्रॉम अराउंड द वर्ल्ड वॉर स्पेंडिंग इन द संडे मॉर्निंग सो quickly i would like to invite our panelists dr malika arjun dr elan kumaran dr shikant kumar sir prakash sir prakash sir namaste so uh, i would like to invite dr anton van herden for his first keynote he is a cataract and refractive surgeon from melbourne australia head of unit at Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital Surgical Ophthalmology Services Director of Eye Laser Specialist and the first surgeon to perform smile and presbyopia surgery in the state of Victoria over to you Dr Anton Vinod we have a uh, yes Arjun ji could please play Arjun ji Dr Anton ka uh, keynote address please play kijiye दालचन जी फ्रॉम मेलबर्न ऑस्ट्रेलिया सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी टू स्पीक एट योर प्रेस्टिजियस इवेंट्स एंड थैंक यू फॉर डॉक्टर बिजवास फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी इट्स अ ग्रेट ऑनर टू बी जॉइनिंग यू गाइस एंड टू बी एबल टू प्रेजेंट my limited experience with small suction loss and um and my title is no reason to panic and really this talk is aimed at those of you who are starting out with small surgery um and my it really just shows my adventure with small and um my experiences so far so we started small um in 2020 uh with the first and only clinic in melbourne offering small surgery so you can imagine there was a bit of resistance from our competitors and there's a lot of um anti small propaganda out there um which has been interesting to manage so why the anxiety regarding suction loss well you know getting new technology is always a little bit daunting and there had been a fairly significant number of reports regarding suction loss with the Visumax and this article by Rupal Shaw once again shows that small obviously gives us great results uh with a high degree of safety however when you're talking about complications suction loss during the procedure comes up as the first complication so it is certainly something that we're fairly um conscious of and fairly um anxious about we all know that the visimax has a gentle curved interface as opposed to a flat interface which you get with the intralays and the wave lights which are used in the past and there's a lower suction and intraocular pressure rise with the visimax and the procedure itself takes slightly longer than lasik which all add to the higher risk or chance of getting a suction loss so what does the literature show us well there's a obviously a, a, a number of articles out there and they vary with their incidence so this huge study by quinet of 12000 cases showed a very low incidence of suction loss as the numbers get smaller the incidence of suction loss increases um as you can see with these numbers and the last one is the incidence of 6.38% which is pretty uh, high. So what you can say is that as the numbers go up certainly the um frequency of suction loss decreases. So it obviously gets better as your technique improves and as you get more experience with smile. So how do we manage suction loss? Well, the best uh, uh information you can get regarding this is by Dan Ronstein. and I attended his um forefront refractive surgery course in London in 2019 and studied his book extensively and really I've just translated some of my findings regarding um regarding smile suction loss uh, based on his teaching so thank you Dan and uh, uh I'd like to uh shout out to to him and his um compatriots regarding the information which is really fantastic So first of all prevention is really key and um as uh uh Dan Ryan has mentioned prattle is very important so surgery prattle with the patient during the procedure we constantly talk through after the laser procedure to make sure that the patient's um aware and we count down the 30 seconds or 28 seconds it takes to do the the smile procedure 
Also, we make sure that the patient has very clear instructions prior to the surgery. And this needs to be translated if you change personnel. And we've had this experience where we had an increased incidence of suction loss when we changed some personnel within our ranks. And uh, that was pointed out to us by the um, uh, Zeiss technicians, which is really quite useful. And also ocular surface fluid control. So I find that if there's too much fluid in the interface, then obviously there's a high risk that the Visumax interface could slip off the cornea. And be prepared. So on our Visumax, we've stuck the um, cheat sheet with uh, the suction loss management, uh, just in case we get into that situation. Uh, we always look at this prior to starting surgery, just to remind ourselves what we need to do if in the case we do get any suction loss. So it's really useful to have that freely available and that's stuck onto the top of the Visumax. So um, this is a re restart treatment wizard and it's very intuitive and very clever, but I'll just go through some of these um, individual steps. And really it's important to know what the steps in SMILE are and when suction loss occurs for the individual situations. So our experience so far is uh, we've done 500 eyes so far. So it's still early in our, um, we still sort of early in our smile experience, I guess. Um, however, you know, we are getting more confident with the procedure. And um, in our time, we've had three suction loss. So it's less than 1%, um, which is, you know, we, that's, I guess, is acceptable after um, this number. And we certainly don't want to increase that. So we'll, you know, uh, take the preventative measures where we can. So we've had one suction loss within the lenticle cut, over 10% of the lenticle cut, one during the cap cut and one during the cap side cut, which I'll show you in a moment. So the first thing to say is that the Visumax really is awesome. And you know, this is a patient who has very obvious nystagmus and had smile procedure, which was really pretty good. You can see how the um, Visumax, the eye is very solid during the actual laser procedure. And you can see the obvious nystagmus there and it was even worse on the second eye. Um, but once the suction's on, the eye was really rock solid and there's no sign of any suction loss. So you can see once again that the Visumax, even though it has those lower parameters than something like the intralase, it is an obviously very robust suction. So this is um, the suction loss that occurred during um, cap cut. And this is the first one that happened. And you can see the cap is sort of a third of the way through. And we just followed the wizard, which says you redock and you restart. So we managed to restart and successfully remove the lenticle without any issues. Um, it is obviously quite tricky to, for the patient to fixate as they can't see through the OBL or the laser cut. Um, however, there are grooves where the laser has uh, applinated and, the, and the, the cap kind of just slotted straight in there. And so that we didn't have any issue with redocking this patient. Uh, the, the, this is the, uh, the wizard, which basically tells you what to do. So you really don't have to think too hard about it and just redock and carry on. And you don't have to change anything on the settings. <coughs> This is the second uh, suction loss we had. It was during the lenticle cut in the second half of the lenticle cut. So uh, this to me was, uh, there was too much uh, water or fluid in the interface, as you can see it's sort of getting in there. I don't think really think the patient moved their eye, but it seemed to me like there's too much water in the interface. What did the wizard tell us? It told us redock and do LASIK. And it's quite intimidating doing LASIK over that um, lenticle cut because even though we know that it's very deep within the stroma, it uh, does freak you out that you think um, you're gonna get a uh, mixture of layers. So, um, and also with the, once the LASIK's done, it, you can see that uh, the OBL was in the, that old ventricle cut. So this patient did very well. Um, there was six, five in each eye. We did smile on the second eye and uh, we converted the site to LASIK after. This was the first eye we did and smile on the second eye and both did very well. And once again, this is the, the treatment wizard. It says do a um, thin flap LASIK over that. Uh, we generally do a 100 micron flap with the Visumax. And so we just reduce the size of the flap. So you know, our standard cap size is 135 microns. 
And you know that the lenticule is you know quite far away from that, so there's plenty of space in order to create a, a LASIK flap, and so that was pretty easy and successful. Our least successful <laughs> um, one, where it's always good to show the, the bad outcomes, is the cap side cut. So this is um, uh, uh, just did not go well. This is a young chap. Um, he had very poor English. And um, you can see what happened there. So it was just all very bad. And I tried to, this was during the capsize cut, there was no cut there, so I was unable to enter. And I just aborted the procedure and came back two weeks later and performed LASIK, which is not ideal if somebody's expecting to get smile. So where did I go wrong there? So this is the, um, this is the wizard. So in this case, the wizard didn't actually detect that there was a suction break during the cap cut. It, I assume that as it broke off and got the OBL, it uh, it did actually make a cut, but not all the way through. So um, the wizard basically tells you to reduce the cap diameter and um, increase the depth of the cap side, that you can reduce the diameter a little bit and increase the depth, therefore ensuring that you are actually in the, um, the pocket. Um, so where did we go wrong? So I think we didn't take enough time with this patient um, regarding his instructions. We could have spent a bit more time explaining the, the instructions to him. And really what I should have done was, um, as soon as I, there was a sign that it was uh, uh, not going well, I really should have just stopped the section. So Dan Reinstein's teaching is pause, regain control and continue. If I had just stopped um, at early on, then I think it would have been a better outcome. So I'll just replay that video for you. So really what I should have done was um, stop around about now and um, regain control, but I was too late. So yeah, no good. I'll take that one on the chin. And um, hopefully next time we have a capsize cut, which there will be, I'll do, um, uh, do a better job. Um, so what about if uh, the, we haven't experienced the lenticle cut in the first um, attempt, the lenticle cut, very simple, you just read on and um, carry on uh, according to the wizard, and the lenticle side cut um, automatically reduces the diameter of the um, lenticle and increases the depth to ensure that you make a good lenticle um, side cut. Uh, we haven't experienced uh, suction loss through that either. So. In conclusion, um, the, the rumor of increased suction loss of Zizumax is really not true. Um, uh, you just need to be prepared and need to have um, your wizard instructions ready. Prevention is better than cure by far, so if you take those steps and are meticulous with the steps to prevent suction loss, I think then uh, the incidence of You know, be like me in that third and panic, which is kind of exactly what I did. All right. Suction loss does not equal vision loss. It's a fantastic machine and fantastic software. So thank you very much. I hope that allows some of your fears regarding suction loss with the Vizumax and during small procedure. So thank you once again for inviting me to this forum. Greatly appreciated, and hopefully uh, we'll get to meet face to face in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Dr. Partha Vishwas from uh, Scientific Committee team. Uh, thank you, sir, for all your help and uh, your wonderful lecture. Uh, Dr. Ellen Kumaran and uh, Dr. Amrita. We have another guest faculty with us, Dr. Sharfuddin Ahmed from Bangladesh. Uh, do have him in the talk as well, and uh, I leave it to you. Have a great day, Sarputin, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, yes. all of you have a very, very nice day. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We are very fortunate to have with us Professor Mohammed Sarputin Ahmed. He has been instrumental in establishment of Vision Center and uh, he has been Apparently. as Vice Chancellor of Bangladesh. Uh, Banga Bandhu Sheikh Muji Medical University for the next three years. Over to you, Professor Mohammed Sarfuddin Ahmad. Okay. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Good morning to you all.
Uh, you all know that uh, my topic is establishment of vision centers and its impact on eye care services in Bangladesh. Then uh, you all know that uh, how we can improve the okay uh, establishment of vision centers and its impact on eye care services in Bangladesh. Good day to you all. I welcome you all to my presentation, Establishment of Vision Centers and its impact on eye care services in Bangladesh. You all know that Bangladesh is now working for the prevention of blindness in such a way that we have uh, had a new model of vision center. The model of vision center is anticipated by Vision 2020, the right to sight a global initiative of International Agency of Prevention of Blindness. Aligning with this initiative, government of Bangladesh is planning to set up at least 20,000 vision centers across the country. For providing basic eye care services on a permanent basis in villages has established more than 20 IT enabled vision centers providing telemedicine facility in different upojela uh, such as of Gopalganj, Pirospur, Bagherhat, Khulna, Madarpur, Norail and Rajbari districts. Among them, the Bej Hospital will be in Sheikh Fajilutinesa Mujibai Hospital and Training Institute, which is situated in Gopalganj district. And this name is by the name of the wife of our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur, Mujibur Rahman. Objectives of this vision center is to, uh, the main objective of the vision center are to provide comprehensive eye care by integrating information technology effectively that would facilitate providing quality care at the doorsteps of the rural population. Collaborate with community and promote eye health education and create awareness proactively, change the health seeking behavior of the community and thereby slowly move away from camps to the sustainable center-based approach. Each vision center will cover a population of about 45,000 to 50,000. This vision center will help by providing permanent eye care facilities in rural areas, motivating people to seek earlier treatment for vision problems, allowing them to reintegrate back into the workforce instead of becoming visually impaired. These centers are equipped with basic ophthalmic equipment like slit lamp, auto refractometer, stick retinoscope, direct ophthalmoscope, trial sets, geostonometer, basic sterilizer, BP instruments, and a computer with a digital camera in place of webcam and internet connectivity. These centers are run by well-trained two ophthalmologists, nurses, ophthalmic nurses, who perform slit lamp examination, refraction, treating minor ailments like foreign body removal, counseling, etc. All vision centers are linked with Sheikh Fajilutin Samujibai Hospital and Training Institute, which is situated in Gupalganj, and uh, for consultation and also to access secondary or tertiary level eye care. All the patients examined at the vision center and a cons uh, which will be consulted with the ophthalmologist at Sheikh Fadilutin Samudhi Bai Hospital and Training Institute who will interact with patients as well. Patients who require procedural intervention are asked to come to the hospital. These are the vision center activities. This vision center works closely with the community through community workers who create awareness about the eye problems in the community. In addition to the vision center, one ophthalmic nurse act as a coordinator to look after the non-clinical activities such as registration, maintenance of records, statistics, and interaction with various stakeholders like outreach manager, outreach organizer and field workers. Before conclusion, I want to elaborate that these vision centers in Bangladesh is working so uh, 
uh, helpfully to the rural community that the people are getting services which they would not get it earlier. And we are about to uh, complete this vision center with the prevention of blindness program in our country, along with the help of our uh, government of Bangladesh. And our, I am very much thankful to our Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who has given keen interest for the establishment of this vision center in Bangladesh. Thank you very much for patient sharing. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for a very uh, elaborate but yet uh, within time description of your experience in Vision Center. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our next presentation, which is Prakash Kumar Chaudhary. He is a prominent FACO surgeon practicing at Chittagong. He is a professor and head in Ophthalmology at Bhagavandu Memorial Hospital at Chittagong. He regularly provides treatment to his patients at Bangladesh Eye Hospital. Over okay. to Dr. Chaudhary. Bilal. Bilal. I request everyone, please keep yourself on mute. Respected chairman, panelists, and delegates, greetings from Bangladesh. I'll be talking hydro dissection in FACO emulsifications. Howard Fine is the pioneer of cortical cleaving hydro dissection and introduced the technique to separate the lens substances from the capsules. Various types of cannula are used for hydro dissections. A straight hydrocanula is most commonly used, but I am mostly comfortable with a Akahoshi, a small band hydrocanula, which I can place underneath the anterior capsules up to the equator and can inject fluid directly behind the nucleus without tenting of the anterior capsules. Regarding the size of a syringe, from this above formula, we can see the pressure is inversely proportional to the surface area. So because of less surface area, a small syringe can generate more injection pressure and more injection pressure is more efficient to separate the lens substance from the lens capsule. A one cc syringe is my choice for my, for my effective hydro dissections. Coming to the diameter of cannula, here you can see the flow is inversely proportional to the resistance. So the flow will be less if the resistance is more. A small diameter cannula provide high flow rate, but prevent too much injection of fluid. A 27 gas hydro cannula with flattened tip is my choice. With flattened tip, the fluid is distributed in a fan-like manner, which is useful to dissect the lens substance. There are various steps for successful hydro dissection. Tip number one. Before initiating hydro dissection, first generally depress the posterior lip of the incision to take out some viscoelastic substance to reduce the anterior chamber pressure. This will allow the forward bulging of the nucleus and escape of fluid from the capsular bag into the anterior chamber. Tip number two, inject fluid with adequate force of injection, but not too rapidly to generate sufficient hydrostatic force, which is effective to separate the lens substance from the capsular bag, but slow and gradual injection not effective. Hello. Tip number three, stop injections once the nucleus is pops up, but it is not wise to continuous injection of fluid until a clear fluid wave is visible. Tip number four, immediately decompress the nucleus once the nucleus is pops up to push the nucleus back. This will cause movement of the fluid from the capsular back into the anterior chamber, and this fluid movement will enhance the separation of corticocapsular adhesion at equator. Tip number five, avoid forceful rotation because it may cause zonular dialysis. The cardinal signs of successful hydro dissections are clearly visible fluid wave, forward bulging of the nucleus, and escape of fluid following decompression of nucleus. The role of hydro dissection in FACO emulsification are it separates the lens substances from the capsular bag and allow the nucleus to rotate. It reduces the stress on zonules during rotation 
and detaches the lens epithelial cells and thus reduce the incidence of PCO, it also greatly enhances the good cortical cleanup. The main goal of hydrodissection is rotation. But if, rot if the nucleus do not rotate after successful hydrodissection, it is wise not to go for forceful rotation because with forceful rotation, all the sharing forces will be transmitted to the zonular complex and it will be end up with zonular dialysis. So the, so if the good idea in this case, don't bother about rotation, rather proceed for escaping and divide the nucleus. Sometimes after division of the nucleus, it allows the nucleus to rotate. And still if you do not rotate, then do repeat hydrodissections. Here you can see successful hydrodissection with a clearly visible fluidate. I divide the nucleus completely, but still the nucleus is not rotating. So I proceed for repeat hydrodissections. Now we can see the nucleus start to rotate. So hydrodissection can be done at any stage of the procedure. Another goal of hydrodissection is it prevent the incidence of PCO. A good hydrodissection dislodges the lens epithelial cells from the phonics of the capsular bag who are the main culprit for the formation of PCO and thus reduce the incidence of PCO. This study was done by Dr. Abhayar Baswada and it was found that hydrodissection combined with rotation significantly reduced the number of lens epithelial cells from the phonics of the capsular bag and thus reduce the incidence of PCO. Another goal of hydrodissection is good cortical cleanup. In some clinical scenario, multi-quadrant hydrodissection is more effective than the single quadrant hydrodissection. Here you can see the cataract is associated with corticocapsular adhesion. These are some strong mechanical adhesion between the lens substance and the capsules. And in ICCC, the nucleus rotation is very difficult. And if it is not rotated, it is not wise to go for forceful rotation. Here nucleus is not rotating after initial hydrodissection. So I proceed for repeat hydrodissection. I'm injecting fluid to the site of CCA to break the adhesions. Now we can see the nucleus is start to rotate as the separation is completed. In eyes with floppy iris, I first inject a very small amount of dispersive OBD over the iris, especially on the sub-incisional area to achieve more pressure gradient above the iris. Then I do judicious multi-quadrant hydrodissection. Every time I inject very small amount of fluid and after every inject, I decompress the nucleus so that excessive pressure cannot build up behind the iris. Otherwise, it will cause iris prolapse. Hydrodissection should be performed very carefully and gently in ice with incomplete dexis. Every time I inject very small amount of fluid and decompress the nucleus immediately to prevent prolapse of the nucleus. Otherwise, excessive and forceful hydrodissection may cause extension of tears. In ice with heart cataract, I avoid hydrodissection after making dexis to avoid capsular block because there is no potential space for the fluid to pass. So after making excess, I proceed for escaping and divide the nucleus to create a dissection plane so that fluid can pass through the dissection plane. And sometimes it allows the nucleus to rotate. If do not rotate, then I do hydrodissection. I inject very a small amount of fluid and forward bulging of the nucleus is a good indication for successful hydrodissection, which allow the nucleus to rotate. Though hydrodissection looks very simple and easy to perform, it may cause some unwanted complication. Here you can see the nucleus is prolapsed into the anterior chamber due to excessive injection of fluid. So by avoiding excessive injection of fluid, we can prevent these complications. Hydrodissection should not be performed through the side port because excessive amount of fluid cannot come out through the side port. So increased pressure gradient behind the iris will cause iris prolapse. Another unwanted consequence of hydrodissection is intraoperative capsular block syndrome. Though it is a sign of successful hydrodissection, it may cause some unwanted complication if appropriate measures are not taken. If it the cardinal signs of capsular block syndromes are forward bulging of the nucleus, shallowing of the anterior chamber, and prominence rexis margin. If it occurs, it is wise not to go for forceful decompression because it may cause posterior capsular rupture. It is also wise not to go for forceful rotation because it may cause zonular dialysis. So the good idea in this case, proceed for escaping, divide the nucleus completely so that fluid can move through the dissection plane into the anterior chamber and this will allow the nucleus
to rotate. Here we can see the people snap sign due to the, the post blowout rupture of the posterior capsule with excessive injection of fluid. In some clinical scenario, hydrodissection should be avoided, like posterior polar cataract, traumatic cataract, history of multiple intervital injection, and post vitrectomy eye. In this clinical scenario, I prefer to do inside out hydrodelination to separate the nucleus from the endonucleus, which is described by Dr. Abhayar Basabada. At the end, I would like to conclude with the following take home message remove OBD prior to initiate hydrodissection. Avoid excessive injection of fluid, always look for visible fluid wave, and immediately decompress the nucleus. Once the nucleus is pops up, hydrodissection can be performed at any stage of the procedure and avoid forceful rotation and do hydrodissection through the main port, not through the side port. Multi-quadrant hydrodissection is effective in certain clinical scenario like corticocapsular radiation and always careful about the interoperative capsular block syndrome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, for beautifully touching all the aspects of hydrodissection, which is very much essential in a commonly uh, performed surgery that is phacoinversification. I would like to ask, the, like, uh, request the panel also if they want to discuss. I, I like uh, invite the panel members to discuss regarding the talks also. Dr. Ilan. Uh, that's a very good uh, presentation by Dr. Chaudhary, actually. Um, I think he had made it uh, clear everything. Thank you, Dr. Ilan. So we'll go, uh, quickly move into our next presentation by Dr. Bilal Hussain. Uh, he's currently working in Combined Military Hospital, Dhaka, as a vitro-retinal surgeon. Previously, he has worked in National Institute of Ophthalmology and Hospital, BIRTM, uh, and Ismailia Eye Hospital. Over to you, Dr. Hussein. Respected chairpersons, dear audience, Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Bilal Hussain. Welcome you all our today's presentation. I'm very much grateful to All India Ophthalmological Society for inviting me as a guest faculty. So today I will share regarding our experience regarding pre-operative posterior capsule tear management, how to handle for secured vision. So pre-operative posterior capsule tear is a totally unexpected phenomenon. It's usually occur due to intravitreal injection or trauma. Careful planning is essential and meticulous power operative handling will help the, to land in a safe position. And definitely it needs effective vitreoretinal support. So today I will share two cases with you regarding handling of pre-operative posterior capsule tear for secured vision. So this case usually presented to us after uh, one week due to inadvertent injection of intravitreal anti-VGF in the lens, subsequently rupture of the posterior capsule and development of the cataract. So you plan for cataract surgery with usual procedure. So all the, all the situation was not secure to implant a lens within the capsular bag. So we may implant a IOL in the sulcus also. So with this aim, we have done a capsular axis with a bit smaller size. And after capsular axis, we haven't done any hydro dissection or hydro delineation. We have separated the capsule with the help of a spatula. 
So then with low parameter and low bottle height, where we started phacomal simplification. So after completing the most of the first of the uh, most of the part of the nucleus, there was extension of the pre posterior capsular tear. So we have done anterior vitrectomy, and with the cutter, we have removed the remnant of the nuclear matter and cortical matter also. So while removing the cortical matter, we was careful not to further damage the capsular bag, especially the anterior capsular margin or rim. So first we have tried to implant a multi-piece foldable intraocular lens in capsular bag. but there was no sufficient support. And there was a tilting of the lens in the capsular bag. So ultimately we have removed it. So due to damage in the multi-piece foldable lens. So at, at last we have implanted a PMM lens in the sulcus. The anterior chamber wash was done meticulously. So after one month vision was 636 and this poor vision was due to macular scar because patient was getting injection for CNV. So now I will share with you another cases. Well, this case was also presented uh, with a profound loss of vision after intravitreal injection in case of pathological my myopia due to myopic CNB. Uh, just after uh, one week, patient developed uh, something is dense white in his pupillary region. So actually, uh, then we planned uh, again for cataract surgery with facial emulsification as there was no retinal detachment in B scan. So purposefully, we also have done a, a bit sm uh, small capsular axis. And in this case also, we uh, didn't any hydro dissection or uh, delineation as there was a, uh, supposed to have a posterior capsule tear due to intravitreal injection. So we just separate the cortical matter with the help of the spatula from the, so after separation of the cortical matter from the anterior part, uh, part of the capsule, then we will start phacoid massification. So after starting the phacoemulsification emulsification and cracking one part, then to reduce the pressure over the capsular bag. So I shifted to bimanual IA to uh, remove the loose cortical matter, even uh, some remnant of the nuclear matter also. So ultimately the whole phacoemulsification procedure was completed with the help of Echo probe. So after removing the all nuclear and cortical matter, 
then we uh, ensure there is no vitreous in uh, anterior chamber. Actually, this is a case of a posterior capsular tear. You uh, now can see the extension of the posterior capsule, capsule tear. So with the bimanual IA, we have removed the whole cortical matter from the capsular bag. As there is a uh, support in the posterior capsule, uh, along with the every support at the posterior uh, part of the capsule, so we plan to go for a in bag IOL implantation after ensuring the no vitreous in the posterior region. So foldable intraocular lens was implanted in the capsular bag. So gently all the uh, visco was removed. So after inserting the centration of the lens in the bag, then case was uh, secured. And after uh, three weeks, there is a vision was 6.9 and I will in the bag with normal intraocular pressure. So preoperative posterior capsular tear is not uncommon. Careful preoperative evaluation is essential. And to handle this situation, there should be prepared par operative all arms for secured vision. And definitely regarding the subsequent progression, position of the lens or further surgery due to IOL drop or nuclear drop, even further complication, a meticulous counseling will be done to the patient and his attendant. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hosein. I now open uh, the topic for discussion for the panels. Dr. Amrita Vinod here. Ma'am, uh, our hall is running late. Uh, may I request you, let's take the next speaker and maybe we can have that discussion later because there are other speakers, they need also some time. For sure, the sure. Dr. Hussain, there is a uh, question for you in the chat box. Would you please uh, like to answer yeah. it? Uh, sure. The chat box, there was a PEC decision notice uh, in the In the first case, actually, it was clearly visible. There is a uh, decision in the posterior capsular tear. But in case of second case, as there is a dense cataract, actually posterior capsule was not visible. But along the from the history, and I also have seen the patient actually one month back, there was a clear lens and just patient was getting intravitreal injection. And after getting the injection, subsequently after uh, a few hours in, in the next day, he uh, noticed there is a profound loss of the vision along the development of dense cataract. So definitely after intravitreal injection and there is no other history of trauma, and sudden develop, uh, development of the cataract, definitely it is maybe maybe task due to needle from the intervitreal injection. So this should be clarified or uh, keep in mind due to uh, from the history actually. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. So quickly, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Malikar Shun. Uh, he's a senior consultant and head of department of cornea and refractive surgery at Shankara Eye Hospital, Shimoga. Over to you, Dr. Malikar Shun. Uh, uh, please enable me to share my screen. Vinod, could you uh, help Dr. Malikarjun in the same? Yes. Uh, Dalchan ji, sir, ko help kijiye. You have to simply just uh, uh, push the button of share screen, sir. There is a green colored uh, share screen. No, nah, I know that, but it is showing me host disabled prostate patient uh, oh, screen oh, oh, oh. sharing. Because the other presentation yes, yes, yes. are okay, you able to do it now? Yeah, now I can do it. Thank you. Yes, yes sir. Good morning, all. Uh, at the onset, I would like to thank Dr. Partha Biswas for giving me this in, uh, opportunity. In uh, dial surgery, nowadays the big uh, common procedure is big bug technique because many of the surgeons have been trained in this uh, uh, technique and uh, most of them prefer to do this technique. And the most uh, common indications for big bubble are uh, 
uh, keratoconus, antistromal dystrophy like lattice macular and granular, and superficial and mistromal opacity due to various reasons. Now I show the video of a dance procedure. Uh, I have done a partial uh, thickness definition and extend the groove deep up to the uh, up to 80 percent depth of the stroma, and I make a part then a little bit dissection at the uh, superior, superior cap and the stroma, and uh, this is a preparation for me to inject the air uh, in the stroma, and uh, again with a I use a 26 gauge needle. Uh, which is attached to the air, air filled or cannula and make a small uh, groove there. And with the, in the groove, I inject the needle inside and go up to center of the uh, cornea and uh, the bevel is down and, and inject the air. So now I'm not able to get the uh, big bubble. So I change the uh, side and again, Making a groove, I inject the 26 gauge needle and gently push the air. And now I get the good big, big bubble. This is the type one big bubble because uh, it is a central one and you can see the distinct margins clearly. And it is not extending up to the desmond membrane, uh, up to the limbus. So the it is a clear it is a cleavage between the the duvas layer and the antistroma. Uh, after doing this, uh, we have to remove the anterior stroma, that is anterior cap of the stroma by gently dissection. Once I remove the uh, stroma, I have to, now I release the air bubble by, with the help of sharp instrument. Now air bubble has been removed and there is an interface between the antistroma and the, uh, the predestment member that is the duvad layer. Uh, now it will be very easy to uh, cut open the antistroma. So uh, uh, if you make a two four quadrant then it would be very easy to remove the uh, whole of the stroma. I make a four quadrant uh, making a, a plus like um, uh, section here. And with the help of curved scissors, I excise the all four quadrants of the stroma. Once it is done, then uh, the donor graft is placed, divided of testament membrane and the sutured, and I confirm uh, uh, the tightness of the sutures with the manual livery and close the eye with BCR. Sometimes we may not achieve the peak bubble because of uh, disorganized stromal fibers, inadequate visualization, or pre existing perforations or thick scars, very thick scars, uh, thick opacities. In these situations, we may not achieve the big bubble. This is the one case uh, of uh, keratoconus itself. I'm trying to do a, a big bubble detective. I inject one time and I'm not able to achieve the big bubble. And second time I tried and third time I tried, still I'm not able to achieve the big bubble. In this situation, what I do is at the edge of the trephination, make a deep groove with the help of a sharp spatula. Go up to 80 to 90% depth. See, once you create that cleavage plane up to 80% of the stroma, 
we can engage the caesar and simply we can cut three in uh, around 360 degree uh, so that the peripheral area of the uh, uh, anti stroma has been uh, cut up to the detachment membrane now with the help of blunt spatula we can just dis re release the adhesions so you have to hold the uh, in the left hand with uh, the uh, stroma in the left hand uh, with the forceps and give a little bit uh, traction so that we can easily release the adhesions there so this we call it as a mushroom uh, type of uh, dalk because uh, once you uh, dissect uh, uh, at the periphery at 360 degree it looks like a mushroom so you can e uh, it, it will be very easy uh, if you just uh, uh, make a good traction and uh, you have the help of blunt trauma you can uh, achieve up to the uh, pre desmet membrane even up to desmet membrane after this we can place the donor cornea and suture it and uh, one more technique is layer by layer dissection of dal uh which is indicated in thick and deep stromal uh, scars involving uh, uh, not involving up to desmet membrane like example post infectious uh, keratitis scars and uh, 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 hydrops and uh, in uh, thin corneas in uh, dense uh, lipid keratopathy uh, the deep the diffuse scar for recurrent corneal keratitis pediatric age group with stromal opacities corneal scarring secondary to prior inflammation or fibrosis where we cannot achieve the deep bubble this the layer by layer dissection technique can be used here i am uh, uh, operating on a case with post infectious keratitis scar i make a partial trephination and uh, extend the groove up to 80 degrees 80% of the depth and take out the superficial scar now what i am doing i am with the help of air i am injecting the air in the stroma and uh, my aim my aim is not to achieve the big bubble just to do a delamination de of delamination of the cornea this can be done by air or bss or with, with viscoelastic i make a, a plus like a, a incision there and it would be easy, then it would be easy for me to uh, take out the four quadrant of the stroma because still i have not uh, it uh, gone deep again i make a one more dissection and take out the stroma so now i uh, gone deep up to the uh, around 80% and the anterior pathology i have removed and place the uh, donor graft devoid of uh, endothelium and uh, suture in place doctor i request you to kindly conclude the asap yeah this is so in conclusion with better understanding of uh, complexity of dal surgery one can successfully complete the dal surgery in different situations thank you very much thank you dr malika arjun uh, for your beautiful tips and various technique of talk quickly i would like to invite dr ilan kumaran who uh, dr ilan has worked in netherdam colombia asia and he is now currently secretary of bangladesh ophthalmology society and uh, scientific committee and he is the chairman of karnataka ophthalmo uh, ophthalmology society so now he is presently working from 2005 as a medical director of navashakti netralaya over to you dr ilan uh, thank you dr amrita not bangladesh ophthalmic society it's bangalore ophthalmic society i at the outset i would like to thank dr partha viswas sir for giving me this opportunity today i'll be talking to you about uh, a relatively new technique that we started using in case we landed up with no capsule support initially we used to use sutures to support the lens if there was no capsule support either a 10090 proline or off late goretex sutures but this involved creation of pockets introduction of sutures tying the sutures to the haptics 
it was a cumbersome long term procedure dr agarwal introduced a new technique wherein the pockets were formed however he used the haptic of the uh, imoel created pockets what are called as shariat pockets and then inserted this haptics inside the pockets that's what he did called it glue and used glue to fixate it however a new technique around 3 to 4 years back made its way by dr mna wherein he again used the haptics but instead of creating a pocket just introduced a 30 gauge needle introduced the haptic into that 30 gauge needle it used to simply fit this with these were pvdf haptics and then introduced the second needle engaged the second haptic the trailing haptic Uh, we will be talking about this in detail how to engage it but just just to show that this was a new technique that he proposed and simultaneously look for the centration and then simultaneously brought out the two needles this is called the double haptic method and then used heat cautery this was bovi cautery created flanges in the haptic of the iol and just used these flanges pushed it inside the sclera so that it was supported in the lamellae of the sclera in india number one the haptics that we were getting were not fitting into 30 gauge needle so we had to resort to certain other new techniques what did we do now this was a case of uh, referred from outside a case wherein the nucleus had sunk inside so we did a vitrectomy removed it we are using a 27 gauge needle a pmma three piece lens specially made available only with the uh, oro lab nowadays and of course one more lens also this was oro lab lens it was quite easy to perform this leading haptic look very easy and then again the trailing haptic was taken inside the eye and it was engaged this is an edited video but i'll show you it was quite difficult for the styling haptic to be uh, implanted so what are the techniques we tried to use is what i'll be showing later how we modified it as a corneal surgeon i prefer to mark with these kind of instruments so that the exact centration is obtained point to be noted always there should be a 2 mm away from the limbus and 2 mm away from that point so that a proper track is obtained and the haptic can be held there if you carefully notice this bevel is pointed towards the iol and then the haptic is captured into that bevel further strengthened by pushing it inside and then taking it out a simple cautery if bovi cautery is not available a heat cautery can be used the only thing we have to make sure is should not touch the haptic now the problem was always happening in the second haptic these are edited videos but this this was particularly this was the first ever surgery i did and here if you notice that the bevel is upside captured and brought out so how do we manage the trailing haptic situation so here is a case more than 270 degree dialysis with you can see that the sphincter is ruptured of course remove the cataractus lens do a thorough vitrectomy that is required in any case of vitreous loss or in any in any of these cases look out for the center as we gain experience no need to mark it just by with the help of a needle we can decide it 2 mm away 2 mm away from that point create a track in the sclera capture the haptic we can see that the bevel is towards the haptic bring it out and the first modification most of us are doing is we create a flange on this so that we do not lose this haptic remember we are using 27 gauge lenses the haptic does not snugly fit inside so using a double haptic method would be difficult in these scenarios now second haptic the problem was in sticking it inside and inserting into the bevel of the needle so how did we modify it simple bring the needle outside many people were doing it but i learned it from dr divyansh slowly 
the haptic is brought out it becomes very easy now once it becomes an extraocular procedure most of us are very versed with this cautery is used flange is created and just pushed and to make sure that the centration is good and the push it into the scleral lamella now this is a case where i am showing the i uh, pupillary reformation also just to show how stable this particular lens is three sutures have been applied and then pupillary reformation is being done by the popular sft technique now i did more than 20 cases uh, including the first one which was uh, which i had to do it in a two staged manner because of certain technical problems uh, almost 3 two and half to 3 years follow up the first case i think is more than two and half years now nearly 3 and no issues as of now till now also very little manipulation faster surgery no need of extra sutures or any other um, special instruments required for it i showed with the 26 micro 26 gauge micro forceps as well as with the max fraction thank you for the opportunity provided thank you uh, dr elan uh, beautifully described the uh, modified technique and sorry again for the glitch that is the uh, like we have our own share of advantage and disadvantage of having uh, speakers over the world sorry for the confusion sir so quickly i would like to uh, invite dr uh, smriti rekha priyadarshini uh, he has been working at edhuprashad eye institute uh, odisha from 2016 and is like uh, my colleague also it's a privilege to welcome her dr smriti over to you Amrita, uh, is my screen visible? Yes, Dr. Smith. Okay. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. I'll be taking the audience through management of microbial keratitis at a primary eye care level. As we all know, that microbial keratitis is a leading cause of corneal blindness, especially in countries like India. The incidence in India is quite high. uh it's about 113 per 1 lakh population in per year so there have been challenges uh in diagnosing and treatment and the, definitely and the, the need of a diagnosis also at a primary eye care level uh some of them are absence of adequate facilities that is microbiology lab well equipped lab and microbiologist second is uh, the practice of uh, traditional medications by the village healers and quacks now it has been there in a study by, uh, from south india that almost 71% of uh, uh, my patients with microbial keratitis are on some medications before they reach a tertiary eye care center so this leads to worsening and delay in starting the appropriate treatment also there is a, um, uh, a rampant use of empirical medications like antibiotics antivirals and antifungals uh, which Yeah, which also may lead to an antimicrobial resistance, which is going to be a global threat in future. The practice of over-the-counter medications still persist in India, and issues with fortified medications. How do we prepare? What is the shelf life, and how patients are compliant with it? So, uh, certain keratitis have a book-like picture. For example, gram-positive. Uh, kokai and gram negative as shown in the picture so clinically uh, if your clinical acumen is good you can most of the time you can get away treating the ulcers with antibiotics but uh, and same with fungal keratitis as shown in the figures uh, if we um, i mean if we if we just remember what we read in our textbooks fungal have a dry raised uh, satellite lesions and uh, high fit borders if you remember that picture so most of the time we can get away treating the uh, patients but sometimes looks can be deceiving uh, for example in all the three pictures uh, we can uh, the in the upper left picture we can see that there is a ring infiltrate which can mimic like a ring lesions of acanthamoeba the dendritic pattern in the second upper right picture 
can mimic the dendritic ulcer of HSV and the deep pinhead lesions in the photo below can also suggest of pythium. But uh, all these three cases, when the scraping was done, it was found to be fungus. So we should always remember that the, the looks can be deceiving. So uh, it is very important to document uh, photos, uh, to document the clinical findings. Now see, these are the four photos which have been sent to us by, from our secondary centers by the residents uh, with the help of a mobile camera, the Android phone uh, from, the, uh, um, from the IPs of the slit lamp. Now uh, documentation is very important to know exactly what the diagnosis is and also serial documentation if done properly can uh, give an idea whether the ulcer is uh, uh, resol resolving or deteriorating. Uh, so uh, for the coming to the diagnosis, uh, the ideal one is the first one. We have a well-equipped microbiology lab, a microbiologist technician, and we do as per protocol, uh, just like this. So uh, in our institute, we do a scraping. Each scraping is uh, undergoes a smear. Uh, we put it in smears and cultures uh, in solid and liquid medium but that is not possible in a uh, semi-urban or a rural eye care setup. So next is basic microbiology facility and learning the technique yourself. So the, this, is a, uh, this is a, a photograph. This is a light, uh, all you need is a light microscope with an investment of 50,000 to 60,000 rupees. You need a gram staining. You need a freshly prepared KOH staining. And the, at least you can do the bare minimum. You can do a gram staining, see the bacteria, fungal filaments, and do the KOH and see the fungus. So you learn the technique yourself, and you can. It will take hardly two, two to three days to learn how to do a gram staining and see under the microscope in the 10x and 40x magnification, and be sure what you are treating. The next is you do the staining yourself. Take a photo, as I had mentioned, by with the uh, with the eyepiece of a. Uh, my simple microscope and uh, I mean, get it confirmed by microbiologists. Again, these four photos are from our secondary centers where we can see that nicely gram positive cocci, negative cocci, fungus, and microspodia can be seen even from even through the microscope. So, the microbiologists can help you confirm it. Uh, next is a management. Coming to the management, uh, there have been uh, studies, a uh, few studies on the in vitro susceptibility of commonly used antibiotics against the bacterial isolates. And uh, it has been seen that uh, cefazoline has a good coverage, vancomycin has a good coverage, and sometimes empirical and sometimes fortified medications like cefazoline with gentamicin and cefazoline with um, fluoroquinolones can give better results. So uh, another recent study which was published in um, uh, 2020 shows that uh, nowadays the gatifloxacin is uh, losing its importance and it can be considered as a treatment of choice in some of the smaller ulcers, uh, but in uh, large ulcers now uh, there is a, uh, definitely there is a development of antimicrobial resistance and the whole world is shifting towards fortified medications. So based on the previous studies, uh, various treatment protocols are followed, the common ones being uh, antibiotics like uh, fluoroquinolones, gatifloxacin, uh, ciprofloxacin, and uh, for fungal, filamentous fungi, it is uh, natamycin, candida, it is amphotericin B, for pythium, linozolide, and uh, for acanthimova, it is chlorhexidine and polyhexamethylene polyhex bigonide. So uh, fortified antibiotics uh, preparation has to be, uh, I mean, uh, these antibiotics have to be available in a medical store. Usually they are, the, they are usually available in all med drug stores, only that we need to know how to prepare it and how to store it, what is the shelf life. So, and also educate the patients where to store in the freezer, uh, in the refrigerator and uh, away from light and uh, make sure that uh, they are used, never used beyond uh, one week period. Um, so again, antifungal eye drops also, voriconazole, um, uh, it is available uh, as a prepare, uh, it is available uh, as an eye drop, but sometimes uh, many places of India, they, it has to be formulated and used. Uh, topical amphotericin B also have to be formulated. Now the usual follow-up protocol is uh, uh, one week, every one week based on, uh, uh, I mean, you see the patient today and you call the patient after three days or uh, one week if the depending on the situation on the clinical picture 
and um, at usually uh, in all bacterial isolates uh, the culture sensitivity report uh, is uh, uh, is available to, uh, uh, and depending on the uh, depending on the um, treatment uh, you can modify the weekly operations there are few emergency procedures that can be done like blue uh, bcl or a tarsurafi or intrastromal and intracameral injections that can be done at a rural eye care center so uh, coming to the last one uh, there is a need for a simple rapid reliable easy to use diagnostic device and based on that my uh, previous work uh, i have done a previous work in this uh, taking the help of uh, government of india and uh, have come up with a uh, first working model of, a, of such a device where uh, again to uh, the bacterium uh, character of the bacterial uh, culture can be identified using this machine and it has given consistent results with uh, uh, the atcc strains and the pure cultures so to conclude microbial keratitis can be managed at primary and secondary levels with a small basic microbiologic setup some procedures like tabcl tarsurafi yeah. and uh, intrastromal injections can be given uh, it is always better if it is managed appropriately at an early stage uh, other options of teleophthalmology can be explored that is definitely a need for the innovating a simple diagnostic device at the future. Thank you, Dr. Smriti, for elaborating the microbial keratitis management and uh, surely your beautiful innovation. So we'll quickly move on to our next uh, presentation, which is uh, by Dr. Shivkan Kumar Sahu. Uh, he has been uh, with uh, Elu Prashad Eye Institute uh, Bhubaneswar since inception and he is the chairman of the scientific committee of Orissa State Ophthalmology and of course my mentor and now my colleague. So he is just uh, sitting next to me and he will be sharing his presentation. Over to you, Dr. Shikhan. Video Okay. Uh, good morning again on a uh, fantastic Sunday morning. What I'll be talking is about the Just a minute, I'll take some time for making it full screen. So, as it makes it full screen, what? Uh, well, Microsporidia, as we know, is a very obligate uh, parasite which is ubiquitously present. Sir, slideshow. Yeah, just a minute, just a minute. Hey, just a minute. Okay. No, no, sir. Front, front. One. Yeah. Just a minute. Just one second. Just one second. There's some glitch. Okay. We'll, we'll continue with this. Uh, some of this slideshow is not working. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I think the pictures are visible. I'll make it a little larger one. We'll go to the. I mean, slideshow somehow is not working here because of something technical. Uh, as we know, the microspheres are small, obligate. Spore, spore forming intercellular thing, which was described long back in maybe in uh, late 1800th century, like 19th century. Uh, it was de described in silkworm disease. So, what is more important here is it is a, it is present in ubiquitously, and the root of infection, as we know, is fecal oral. Um, the source for ocular infection is still yet not known. Before earlier, there were only a few case reports 
and it may occur more commonly than uh, what we expect. Well, the story starts long back, long back in the year 2018, when we, when we uh, published our first uh, report of a epidemic. Epidemic. It was epidemic in this area part of the country about the uh, presence of microspheroid as a cause of keratoconjunctivitis, conjunctivitis, which was earlier more commonly associated with bacterial or adenoviral. We always found out a new one like the microsporidia. The causes were mostly trauma. Maybe what we found was there's some association with rainy season and uh, contaminated water and soil. The other association like topical steroids. Some people said contactless were uh, immunocompressed. So there, there are two different ways of uh, presenting of microsporidia. One is the stromal infective one, which we are not going to talk. What we are going to talk about. Epidemic group, where the symptoms typically is redness, photophobia, some amount of pain and tearing. The patients have multiple coarse, diffuse, punctured epithelial lesions, which are seen with or without anti So, so it's a raised punctured lesions of the epithelium. There's nothing in the stroma or in the endothelium in the person as a sign. We also published how to definitely diagnose it. So we saw that even in KOH or uh, grams, it was 98% uh, detectable. Then we did many other studies where we characterized the uh, character the disease, the where they character the disease, the treatment protocol. Uh, okay, so what is more important is that we saw that they were mainly young males, which which were young uh, person like around 35 years, uh, where the time of presentation was approximately two, uh, two weeks. The time of resolution was approximately a week from the presentation. So, which means that three weeks was a time when people, uh, when uh, when things became good enough for a microcarotid uh, conjunctivitis. We also saw, uh, so have uh, uh, proved it that PHMB, which is the standard uh, drug choice for any microsporidial keratitis, does not work, need not, is not needed here. Uh, placebo is already good enough, uh, lubricant is good enough. So, so what happened now? This story began in 2000, uh, around August, uh, sorry, March, I will tell you the exact date, March 13th, 2018. That is my birthday, so, March, so that's I remember, I saw a patient with this lesion. If I go to the next picture, this is the lesion of the patient, where there is a stromal edema in the center. Sir, with, with sir, the... Excuse me, we are not able to see the screen. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Just a minute. Just a minute. Is it visible now? I know it's not in a full format. Yeah, yeah, it, now it's That's visible. Fine. Yes, the, so, yeah, good, good. Now it's coming the full oh. format. Right, right, and the right in time. So this is the patient, what, what we're talking of. The patient is a patient who came on, on uh, maybe March uh, 13th, uh, 2018, which is my birthday again, I said. And this raised my eyebrow that if this is a condition, uh, then we went back to the history of that patient, same patient who had come presented to us in August 2017 with a diagnosis of microbial keratoconjunctivitis. Then the patient resolved in two weeks. Uh, there were, after two weeks, there were some SEIs out here, which resolved. And uh, then after six weeks, we saw still something, uh, some um, uh, SEIs out here, SEIs, some epithelial infiltrates, which were treated. And the patient was lost, came down after eight months with this picture. With the stromal edema, as is shown in the next picture. Then the patient was treated again, came back again after maybe around uh, in January 2019. Then with July, so it was two years around the uh, down the uh, uh, years. The patient has been following us with recurrence of the same disease. So that raised our eyebrows whether this is a part to the disease or is it something different. Then we thought of looking at the whole scenario again. 
we had forgotten microstructural credit conjunctivities long back, like 2014 was the last presentation uh, publication. So we thought, okay, fine, it's gone, nothing, and no one else is publishing. So is it? It is a common thing for our diaspora, or we have something more than what we are seeing. So we just analyzed it retrospectively from the patients which we saw from 2015 to 2019. We included patients who were micro, uh, microbiologically positive for uh, 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 microsporidia. We analyzed the demography, the clinical feature, and then my them. Because we, from our early experience, we knew that the disease lasts for three weeks. We thought of taking a persistence, means which is beyond three weeks, like around a month. Then we say that this is persistence of microcell character conjunctivitis. We also defined the recurrence. A recurrence means we see a portion of clear cornea, then again the cornea has been affected. And at least there is a disease-free days of four weeks between these two activities. So if our if we follow our protocol, it's like if we see just a uh, conjunctivitis, we just treat with lubricants as already described in literature, literature by us. If it is a SPKs, which is persistent or recurrence, SPKs, we give sometimes topical steroids. SEIs are treated with mostly steroids in the first episode, somewhat, sometimes plus or minus SEIs uh, yeah, with uh, tacrolimus, is sometimes with the steroids. So we saw out of 332 patients we, which we have seen, uh, okay, this is a flu chart. Uh, this flow chart with the BFF 332 patients, of which 49 followed up us beyond four six weeks. And of this uh, 49, 33 for, uh, were for different reasons like cataract or any other reasons, not uh, causative for the uh, for the follow-up of uh, uh, skeletal conjunctivitis. 16 uh, 21 eyes needed continuous care, of which uh, of which if you see the, the the mean age was like there were 11 men and five women in this whole group the 70 the, most of them did not have any predictive factors some uh, eight had pre of this uh, 21 eyes eight had uh, topical antibodies beforehand or and six had uh, corticosteroids beforehand so what we see from this we see three types of patients who are present in symptoms spks chronic spks chronic uveitis or sub infiltrates or, or a mixture of all three. So if you go back to SPKs, we saw nine patients who had SPKs chronically. Of them, of these nine patients, let me reiterate you, three of them were bilateral, patients had bilateral, which means six eyes were, were patients of bilateral concerns. Of these nine eyes, six eyes need steroids in the long term. And we restrip all these, uh, uh, the, the all these SPKs after three to four weeks to confirm whether the disease process is there or not, but all were negative. So the disease per se was not there, and, but uh, the SPKs were present. So we started with steroids in six cases and two cases we needed all also because they were resistant even to steroids only or maybe needed more than necessary steroids. UVATs, the 10 eyes, the mean appearance of UVATs was around eight, the day eight to plus four, uh, plus minus four days. Two eyes of these 10 eyes needed steroid. Rest eight were self resolving. In SEIs, which is described as just sub epithelial cellularity, round ear in nature, 13 eyes had that. Two were bilateral. The mean time of appearance was 10.5 10, uh, 10 days. Resolution was 26 days. If there were more than one mm uh, larger, one, one of the more than larger one mm, there, or, uh, or stromal edema was there. We started with steroids. So out of 13, six need steroids, seven did not need. Of these six, four needed added tacrolimus. Uh, doctor, kindly conclude ASAP. Yeah, yeah uh, just give it to me. So now, if you uh, then, but what was more important was the recurrent diseases. There were six eyes with recurrent diseases. A minimum disease free period was of 64 days. Three eyes, that means 1% of the, uh, sorry, 2% of the whole uh, 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 cohort needed regular follow-ups and six needed steroids with tacrolimus. And tacrolimus was used from 8 to 34 weeks. This is one patient where, uh, which needed, uh, uh, 
this is the uh, definition of persistence where we there wasn't a clear period so we uh, we, we continued treatment for two months this is a patient of of uh, recurrence where there was clear cornea in between and recurrent in between so the persistence is not much of a problem the recurrence is of a problem so if it is bilateral case we need to follow for longer one minute uh, just two seconds one minute the, 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 the persistent aspect have a close watch. In all cases, if it is steroid is not necessary. In SEIs, the first dose is tapering steroids, then if recurrent, we can use tacrolimus in the long run. Thank you. And this is culminated in a presentation of or in AOS in uh, IGO. Thank you in this month. Thank you uh, everyone for this wonderful session across the world. I thank all the speakers, all the panelist members and AIOS for giving us this opportunity. So we can wind up the session for now. Thanks. Ajay. We have any time to uh, discuss because uh, there is one question. <laughs> uh, okay, yes, I think we can give you two minutes. Yes. Okay. There is a question in case of failure of achievement of big bubble. And in presence of intrastromal bubble, bubble, how do you assess the depth of the adequate resection? The first of all, uh, what I will do, I won't go up to the uh, uh, decimal membrane. If I go up to 80% of the stroma, then it, that is enough. Second thing is I will dissect up to till I see the glistening membrane of the uh, till I see the glistening membrane that is duvas layer of the decimal membrane. Other on one way, other other way of doing it, inject air in the antechamber. And uh, we can see the image. Uh, uh, image, uh, yeah, mirror image of the uh, whatever dissector you are using, uh, maybe a keratome or a sharp instrument in the antechamber. That would be my endpoint of dissection. Thank you, Dr. Malikarjun, for taking up that question. Wish you all a very happy weekend. We'll uh, move out, move out to our next presentation. I think end of there is the end of the presentation, sir. Yeah, I will uh, may, uh, move to our next session, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. Okay, madam. Thank you. Th thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amrita, for uh, leading uh, throughout the session. Th thank you so much, all the speakers, for 